Hey, good morning and welcome to Allendale Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Mark. I'm really excited to be able to share the Word of God with you this morning. Uh, we're in the book of Revelation today and we're going to be in chapter 2 verses 1 through 7. You know, I have a favorite, one of my favorite movies is Fiddler on the Roof. I also know it's a Broadway play. I've never had the pleasure of seeing it on Broadway, but I've watched the movie several times. And there's a favorite scene that I have in this movie where Tevia sits down with his wife and asks her this question. He says, Boulder, do you love me? And that, of course, introduces this beautiful song that they sing. It's a back and forth song that they sing to each other. And he's asking this question, Golda, do you love me? And, and she, she responds incredulously. Do I what? Do I love you? What are you talking about? And then she gives a list of, of all the things that she's done for her husband for 25 years. I've washed your clothes, cooked your meals, cleaned your house. She's cooked for him. She's cleaned for him. She's bare, born his children. She's, she's slept in the same bed with this guy. And, and if that's not love, she asks, well, what is? And then Tevia says, then you love me. And she says, I suppose I do. And then Tevia responds, and I suppose I love you too. It doesn't change a thing, they sing. But even so, after 25 years, it's nice to know. Well, it's interesting because today as we look in Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, we see the first church that we're visiting on our journey through the seven churches of Asia. And this first church is the church of Ephesus. And, and Jesus has some things that he wants to say to all of the churches uh, that he wants. He has, he has something to say to each one of the seven churches. But today we're going to focus in on what he has to say to the church at Ephesus. And it has something to do with this question of, do you love me? You know, the church of Jesus Christ really needs to be able to answer that question in the affirmative. And what we're going to find out as we study this particular church is that Jesus didn't see the love that they supposedly had for Christ. Listen, the church of Jesus Christ needs to have a wholehearted love for Christ. We need to, we need to have a, a passionate devotion for Jesus Christ. It, it is the hallmark of our faith. And so as we, as we stop here at Ephesus, there's some things that we need to pay attention to as a modern church. The modern church, our church, Allendale Baptist Church, needs to be a place of passionate, zealous, others-focused, God-glorifying love. That's the kind of love that we're supposed to have. And, and you know what? As we look at the church of Ephesus this morning, we're wise to do a spiritual inventory uh, to see where we're at. We, we must answer a bold and resounding yes to this question do you love me? You know, Christians, it's crucial for us. It's crucial for us to understand. It, it's absolutely imperative for us to understand that the love for Jesus Christ is the most important love that we can have. That's where our focus needs to be. We need to be a people who love Jesus Christ. The church at Ephesus, quite frankly, was an amazing church. There's no question about it. By any standard, it was an amazing church, except for one important quality. They were a church without the power of love. Well, a church without the power of love behind it is an unsustainable church. No church can last without the power of love. So that really leads into the main thought that I want to share with you this morning, and it's this. The church must love above all else. The church of Jesus Christ must love above all else. Now, the church at Ephesus was about to learn this, and you know what? We need to learn this as well. And there are three lessons that we're going to be able to learn as we walk through uh, these seven verses, okay? And, and, and as we learn these, we can become the kind of church that God really is pleased with. And I think we are a loving church, but you know what? 
we can grow in this. I know I personally can grow in this. So there's three lessons that we're going to learn. And the first one is this. Loving Jesus is more important than right living. Let me say that again. Loving Jesus is more important than right living. You might be thinking, whoa, wait a minute, Pastor Mark. What are you thinking? What are you saying? I thought right living was a, was a crucial part of the Christian life, that it was part and parcel of being a follower of Jesus Christ. And well, it is, and don't, don't get me wrong, but did you know, did you know this, that right living, you can, you can live rightly and be wicked in your own heart? Did you know that's possible? That, 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 that you can do all the right things and still be dead on the inside? Yep, that's the facts. It really is true. And the church of Ephesus was heading down this road and, and they were unwittingly carrying on the legacy of the Pharisees. Well, how did Jesus know this? How did he see that this was happening? Well, there's there's an obvious answer. First of all, first of all, Jesus is the omniscient God of the universe, right? We 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 understand that he is all knowing, and and certainly so he knows their hearts. But I want you to see something really interesting in the text of Scripture. Look at how he answers in verse one, uh, chapter two, verse one. He says, "To the angel of the church of Ephesus, write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who." walks among the seven golden lampstands. All right, so I, just if you'd permit me, allow me to kind of rewrite this verse uh, and replacing some of the symbolic language with what it actually means. Okay, so here we go. To the preacher or the elder pastor of the church of Ephesus, write this, John. The words of him who holds the seven elders, not stars, but elders in his right hand, who walks among the seven churches. All right, so do you get the point here? Jesus is not, isn't only um, the authority over the preacher, the, right? That, that star that he holds in his hand, but he's also the authority over the church. And he walks, according to this text, he is actually walking among the church as well. So I want you to think about this. Put this image in your mind. He is with us when we gather as a body to worship. And he knows the thoughts and the intentions of each of our own hearts. So as he's walking, can you picture this? I mean, it's really amazing. Jesus, Jesus attends our worship services. He, he's the guest of honor. And he walks among us as a part of our congregation. And he hears the conversations. He listens to the singing. Uh, he sees us give our gifts. He, he watches us as we listen to the preaching. And he, he knows the heart of the preacher as well. This is really convicting to me. And, and it should be convicting to you as well. Uh, the Lord is among us when we gather to worship. Our Lord is an active participant of our worship time at Allendale Baptist Church. And he knows what's going on. He knows what's going on, and he even knows the intent of our hearts. He, he knows the motivation of us as individuals and the motivation of us as a church. And he knows that if I'm, he knows when I'm preaching a sermon, he knows the motivation of my own heart. He knows uh, that if I, I might be thinking, oh, I sure hope that people will be amazed at my eloquence and my theological prowess, and boy, I sure hope they're impressed with all of that. Or he knows that if I'm genuine and authentically trying to please him, he knows that. And, and, and apparently, he apparently is willing to speak the truth in love to challenge this particular church, the church at Ephesus, regarding the why, quote-unquote, the why of their service. Listen, here's an interesting statement that I've shared with you before. We do what we do because we want what we want. I heard that a long time ago in a, in a conference, and that's always stuck with me. I do what I do because I want what I want. When you serve Christ, what do you want? What is it that you desire? Do you desire self-glorification, self-aggrandizement, or do you desire the glorification of the Savior? Well, honestly, honestly, 
it's really difficult to to do de- to detect on the outside. I can't look at you and and understand the motive of your heart, and you can't look at me and and know what's going on in my heart. The Lord says, I know the heart. I know what's going on in the heart, but we we really can't tell what's going on. But God knows immediately what's going on. And in verses one through three, we see several ways in which the church of Ephesus um, they have a really good outward appearance. Uh, they, they got it going on. They're doing some really good things. But I want you to remember as we walk through this, none of these things that they do supersede loving Jesus. Loving Jesus is the most important thing that a church should be pursuing. All right, so let me give you, let me give you these uh, several things here. The first one is loving Jesus is more important than righteous deeds. That's the first part of verse 2. He says, I know your works your toil, and your patient endurance. Jesus knows all about, all about his people. And, and that ought to be a comfort to us, really. It should, it should comfort our hearts. He, he knew that this was a local church that, was, uh, that worked very hard on, on his behalf. Uh, they toiled. They labored in this church. They, they patiently endured trials since their birth. Uh, as a church, when the Apostle Paul, on his second mission, missionary tour, he visited Ephesus after uh, leaving Corinth, and, and, and there he planted this church. You can read about this in Acts chapter 18 and verse 19. But the bottom line is this. This church specialized in working hard. They were, they were a hardworking church. They were all about doing good for, for the Lord. So that's important to see that, okay? But loving Jesus is more important than righteous deeds. Secondly, we see loving Jesus is more important than a righteous stand. That's the second part of verse two, and it says, "And how can you?" Uh, it says, "And how you cannot bear with those who are evil." So he's saying, "Listen, I see, I see it. You guys are doing great work, and also you cannot, you cannot stand." Uh, you cannot stand uh, with those who are doing evil. It is, you are so determined to be righteous that you can't even fathom the thought of participating with someone if they're in evil. And so Jesus, Jesus further congratulates them for their backbone. They had a spiritual backbone about them. Uh, they were willing to stand up against evil. This was a kind of a church that didn't back down. And, and if, you, if you remember anything about Ephesus... Uh, Ephesus was a place teeming with false religion and false belief systems, and some of those some of those beliefs would inevitably worm their way into the congregation, and uh, and the leadership and the church just wouldn't stand for it. it. It was not happening. So they were very very clear that they were willing to take a stand against evil. But listen, but loving Jesus is even more important than that. All right, there's a third thing I want you to see. Loving Jesus is more important than sound doctrine. All right, look at the next part here in verse 2. It says, But I have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. Okay? They, the church of Ephesus, had false teachers coming in. People who proclaimed themselves to be apostles but were not. Why? Well, this church knew their Bible. They knew their Bible, and the reason they wouldn't put up with false teaching is because they knew the real truth. They knew what was going on. They studied to show themselves approved. They they studied the Word of God faithfully, and they could see any false doctrine that might be coming their way. Uh, They were astute when it came to this, and Jesus commends them for that. Uh, he's he's not he's not just giving them false praise. He's genuinely commending them for these things, for their thorough knowledge of the scriptures. And by the way, this is a this is a must for any Bible believing uh, church. We must know our Bibles so well that uh, when false teaching comes our way, and it inevitably will come our way, that we will be astute enough to see that the Church of Ephesus understood that. If you cut someone in the church of Ephesus and they started to bleed, they bleed, they bled Biblion. I mean, the Bible, Bible would come right out of them. I mean, that is an amazing thing about the church of Ephesus, okay? But you know what? Loving Jesus is even more important than sound doctrine. Interesting. All right, I've got a couple more I want to share with you. Loving Jesus is more important than suffering for Jesus. Look at 
verse 3. I know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my namesake, and you have not grown weary. You know, since this church was planted some 40 years earlier, no doubt it had encountered opposition from those that uh, opposed the message of Christ, especially living in Ephesus, the kind of city that it was. And you can read about some of the trials and the tribulations that they faced in the book of Acts. And there's no doubt that persecution was the result, and they suffered. They suffered for their faith in Christ. This church refused, however, to conform to the social and political pressures, and they remained a faithful and committed church. Uh, they committed, committed to each other and committed to the truth. Uh, and they would stand up for it and they would suffer for it. They were committed to God's truth to such a level that they were willing to suffer for it. But here again, I'm going to tell you this, but loving Jesus is more important than even that. And then lastly, there's one more I want you to see. Loving Jesus is more important than hating the actions of people. Now we're going to jump to verse 6 here because I think it really fits nicely with, with, uh, with these, these items that I'm listing out for you. And in chapter 2, verse 6, it says this, Yet this I have, uh, that I'm, I'm appreciative of, Jesus is saying, that you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Okay, so here's a here, here here's a, a a practical a real life example of of them hating someone who is standing up for that which is false, that's which is evil. They had such a strong appreciation for God's truth, they couldn't stand the actions of the Nicolaitans. Well, who are these people? And I don't want to spend a lot of time here, but uh, MacArthur helps us out with this. Irenaeus writes that Nicholas, who was made a deacon in Acts 6, was a false believer who later became an apostate. Uh, he goes on to say, but because of his credentials, he was able to lead the church astray. And the Nicolaitans were followers of Nicholas, and they were involved in immorality and assaulted the church with sensual temptations. Clement of Alexandria said this, they abandoned themselves to pleasures like goats. That's not a compliment. Leading a life of self-indulgence. Their teaching perverted grace and replaced liberty with license. So you can you can kind of see what's going on here. The Nicolaitans were very much about, hey, I'm going to live any way that I want, and God's just obligated to forgive me. And the Ephesians looked at this, the church at Ephesus looked at this and says, no way, you guys are heretical. And so Jesus commends the, the church at Ephesus, and he says, listen, I agree with you. I also hate what they're doing. So, so I want you to see this. Jesus commended this church, the church of Ephesus, for their hard work and their righteous deeds, for their unbending orthodoxy, for their willingness to stand for truth, even when standing for truth would cause suffering for them. And even Jesus commends them for even calling out the wickedness of a specific group by name that promoted heresy. Uh, these are all good and commendable actions on the part of this church. But I want, I want you to understand, as important as these actions are, as important as these characteristics are, there's something far more important that the church of Ephesus needs to be focused on. And I want to tell you, the church today needs to be focused on and concerned about. And that concern is love. Love for Christ in particular. Now, now to be sure about this, Jesus clearly teaches that by obeying him, that is a demonstration of uh, of our love for him, right? I mean, he, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. So we know that. That's how we can show our love. But this cannot be true of the church at Ephesus because of what Jesus later says, a passage we're going to study in just a minute, but he, what he later says about this church, okay? So we can conclude then that it's possible to be obedient to God without loving God. Let me say that again. It's possible to be obedient to God without loving Him. And I want to tell you, folks, this is a dangerous road to walk. This was the path of the Pharisees. And Jesus, if you remember spending any time in the Gospels, 
And if you haven't, do it. You can see that Jesus does not have a lot of good to say about the Pharisees. Why? Because their obedience was for their own glory and not for the glory of God. you got to tuck that away in your mind. The Pharisees' obedience was for their own glory and not for the glory of God. And friends, this is why Jesus is taking the time to warn the church at Ephesus. Obedience without a love for Jesus leads to self-glorification. Did you hear that? Obedience obedience without a love for Jesus leads to self-glorification. I want to read a passage for you in Luke chapter 18. It's a, a, a great passage that really illustrates this point. Jesus uses this, and it's a parable, and he says this, Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I I get. But this tax collector, standing afar off, wouldn't even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus then says, I tell you, this man, this man, went down to his house justified rather than the other, rather than the Pharisee. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Friends, get the warning here. Understand what's going on. You and I need to take the warning that Jesus is giving to the church at Ephesus. We need to check our spirit as we serve Christ. And if you do it, for your own glory. You are not doing it out of love for Christ, and you have surely received your reward. Check your heart today. Why do you serve the Lord? Well, be careful. There's just, there's some things that we can learn from Jesus' admonition to the church at Ephesus. All right? Now remember, what's the main thought here? The church must love Jesus above all else. And, and, and loving Jesus is more important than right living. It's more important than right living. Number two, loving Jesus is the church's primary priority. I want to say that again. Loving Jesus is the church's primary priority. You're going to notice a tone change here that Jesus takes with the church at Ephesus. And it's a tone that really uh, causes any church to sit up and take notice. And we ought to sit up and take notice. Look at what verse 4 says. He says, But I have this against you, that you have abandoned your first love, or the love that you had at first. I love what the New King James, how the New King James translates it. It says, it says this, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Now that's a, that's a haunting phrase. You have left your first love. And, 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 and I'll tell you what, if, if anyone came to me and said, Hey, Mark, I have this against you, I would be, I'd feel terrible. I'd be like, what? Oh, my goodness. But to hear these words come from the Lord to a church, I, I think that's, it's got to be mortifying, to say the least. Remember, Jesus is dictating this letter to John to be read to the messengers or the preachers, right? The pastors of these seven local churches. And this church at Ephesus is, is getting the message, right? Uh, and, and this church at Ephesus had a good track record with the Lord. This church was once commended, as a matter of fact, for her love for the Lord and for her love for one another. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, it says this, For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayer. Paul was saying, man, I love the fact that you have a robust faith and a great love for one another. And so while the, while the Lord certainly commends the Ephesians church, the, the church at Ephesus, he does have a problem with them. And it's a rather big problem. Their problem is they left their first love. 
So what does that mean? What, what does it mean to leave your first love? Well, to be a Christian, to be born again, means you love Jesus. You love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. And, and, and that's what it means to be a follower of Christ, right? We, we, talked, about, we talked about this uh, in John 14, 21. Whoever has my commands and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And it goes on to say, John goes on to say, and, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest, and manifest myself to him. Well, listen, to, li- listen. Th- this, is, this is the reality that we're, we're facing. To be a Christian, to be a believer, means you love God. Um, now, I want you to listen to these very strong words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 22. It says, If anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. Our Lord has come. Wow. Those are... Those are powerful words. And so Jesus is going to the Ephesians and saying, you have left your first love. This is, this is a tremendous indictment against the church. I mean, how could this be? In, in the first part of the Lord's address to this church, to his church, they seem to be doing all the right things. How could he then say something so harsh to a people that were so faithful. What happened? What what actually went wrong? Well, here's one consideration from a commentary that I read. It said, Most of the Ephesian Christians were now second-generation believers, and though they had retained a purity of doctrine and life and had maintained a high level of service, they were lacking a deep devotion of Christ. Listen. When this church started and grew, it had a profound love for Jesus. And and, and now this second generation of this church is is keeping up the purity, keeping up the orthodoxy, but the love has diminished. You know, this isn't an indictment against all second generation Christians, but I do think there's something we need to pay attention to here. That every generation, every generation of Christian needs to love Jesus with a passionate love. And and the second, third, fourth generation of Christians cannot get a cannot ride on the coattails of their parents or grandparents. You have got to own that love. And this is what he's challenging the Ephesians with. By the way, uh, Paul has something to say about the result of uh, of what happens when love is absent. Very familiar passage, it says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 8, If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but not have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but I have not love, I am nothing. I, if I give away all that I have and deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I gain nothing. Uh, love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. It endures all things. Love never ends. By the way, that book, 1 Corinthians, is all about a church that's fussing and fighting at each other. And they're not exhibiting the love that they should be towards one another. What happens? What happens when the church of Jesus Christ loses her first love? Now, let me rephrase that. I think, I think it's even stronger that. What, what happens when the church of Jesus Christ abandons her love for Jesus? Because that's the word that's used here. And to abandon means to cause someone or something to undergo separation. It's to let go. It's to send away. It's to divorce. That's a strong word that our Lord uses here. That they abandoned their first love. This is what Jesus is accusing the church at Ephesus of. And by the way, this is uh, no empty allegation. Because Jesus knows their heart. 
He's not saying, I think you've abandoned. He knows that they have abandoned because he knows their heart. He's able to, he's able to see all of their actions. He, he can see all of their deeds, but he also knows their lack of love for him. And so all of those actions and all of those deeds are meaningless. What happens? What happens when a church abandons her love for her Savior? Well, there's a few things that I think of. Their passion and zeal begins to grow cold, and and the works that are done for the Lord become cold and mechanical. Another thing that happens is their service changes. Now, the Ephesians, their service was commendable, but when it's done with no heart, it becomes displeasing to the Lord. Listen, doing all the right things for all the wrong reasons is a recipe for either legalism or license. And it's love that keeps us centered on doing the right things for the right reasons. Another thing to consider is their love for others quickly diminishes as well. In fact, Love for God and and love for others is so closely related that some scholars, as they've studied through this passage, believe that that this is what Jesus is talking about. That that when he says they lost their first love, he's talking about their love for God and for each other. That it's, it's synonymous. Regardless, when you lose your love for Jesus, your uh, your loss of love for others is not far behind. Let me give you an example. If, you're, if you are looking at others and judging them for what they do or what they say or what they wear or how they act, if you're judging them in your heart, if you're looking down your nose at them and you're feeling very superior over them, then you're missing the point here and you're not, and you're not loving them for who they are. Who are they? They are creatures that are created in the image of God, right? And so if, if, if you're judging them and you're not loving them for who they are, created in the image of God, you might be in danger of losing your first love. There's one more danger for a church that abandons her first love, and it's significant, and it's really worth paying attention to. And I'm going to have you hold on to that just for a minute because because uh, Jesus addresses it in verse 5. and So we'll get to that in a little bit, but it's so important. I want to touch on it more, uh, more fully in just a minute. But what I do want you to understand is what Jesus is communicating in this passage. The church at Ephesus and all churches that believe the Bible as their final authority for faith and practice, we all must understand this simple principle. Loving Jesus is our primary priority. Loving Jesus is our primary priority. Better better yet, think of it this way. It's our our every priority. Gregory Coles wrote a wonderful little article I want to share with you. Uh, The article's titled, Why You Need to Stop Making God Your First Priority. And in, at the end of the article, he argues this. He says, God wants more than just the top line of your priority list. He wants the whole list. He doesn't want to be sequestered to a single part of your life. He wants to be the substance of every part, the, the logic behind every choice you make. Whether you are singing a worship song or taking a nap, God wants his kingdom to be your ultimate goal. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, So whether you eat, or whether you drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. He goes on to say, So stop making God your first priority. Live a life that is more radically biblical than that. Give him everything. Make him your every priority. Boy, I think that's really a good way to say it. Uh, I think his point is well taken. The church at Ephesus was missing the point. Doing religion, being religious, isn't what God is looking for. Believing orthodoxy isn't enough, as important as it is. Doing good works, as wonderful as those things are, are insufficient. 
Instead, he wants his bride, first and foremost, over all, to love him. God wants the heart of the church. He wants your heart. Can you imagine, for, with me, just imagine in your mind for a second, a wife doing wifely things for her family, whatever those might be, and especially for her husband. She's you know, she's serving her family and her husband in, in a variety of different ways. My wife uh, around here does, uh, she does the laundry and, uh, and, and, uh, and she, she cooks uh, most of the dinners for us and, and she does, I vacuum, that's my job, I'm the floor guy. So we have our different responsibilities. But imagine the wife in this situation uh, doing all of those things devoid of love, without love. Do you think that the husband would eventually catch on that his wife is doing everything uh, without love? Just simply doing, doing her duty, doing, doing these tasks out of a, out of a duty or a, a re, just out of responsibility? Well, I'm a husband, and, and if my wife had this robotic, uh, duty-centered attitude, I'd be devastated. My heart would be broken because... because our hearts aren't united. And, and I, think, I think this is what Jesus is driving at here. The Lord wants our hearts. Jesus wants your heart. He wants your love. First and foremost. Yes, all those other things that are listed are very important. But first and foremost, he wants your heart. He wants your love. By the way, I don't know if you thought about this, but he doesn't coerce or force our love. It... it it would cease to be love if that's what he did. But he does work at convincing us to love him. How does he do that? Well, certainly through the many blessings that he gives you. Think about it. I mean, that old, that old hymn, count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. Right? That's a really good and healthy practice for us to do on a regular basis, a daily basis. You just consider all that God has done for you and give him thanks. But there's another, there's another area that uh, I want to share with you how he convinces us of his love for us, right? And, and uh, it's through the gospel. It's through the message of the gospel. Can I ask you a question? Is there a more compelling reason to love God than the gospel? I mean, when you truly understand the gospel, it, the gospel shows us God's love in a breathtakingly powerful way. You, a wicked sinner, thumbing your nose at God, living your life however you want to live, and God loving you so much that he sent his son to come to this earth to live a sinless life, to die a criminal's death on a cross, to pay for your sin debt, satisfying God's wrath that was supposed to be poured on you, but instead is poured on Christ at the cross. And, if, and then in, on the third day, he's raised from the dead, uh, thus solidifying his mastery over death, that he has beat death and it no longer has a sting. I mean, when you think of the gospel and all that our Savior went through, dying, buried, and rose again so that he could pay your sin debt. And why did he do that? Well, the Bible tells us in Romans 5, right? God demonstrated his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to clean up. He didn't wait for us to get ourselves all religious and start doing all the right things. He didn't do that. He, he, he died for us before we were ever even close to being there so that we could have a relationship with God the Father and have, any, and have the promise of eternal life. I, I cannot think of a more compelling reason for me to love God than the gospel and by the way, the only reason I can love God is because he first loved me. And he demonstrated that love through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Folks, that is an amazing concept. And our, our response to God's profound gesture of love through the gospel is a, is a life of love for the one who provided salvation for us. I mean, think about this. 
Can you imagine how devastating it would be for Jesus to utter these words to the church of Ephesus? Say, man, you guys have lost your first love. Do you remember what I accomplished for you? How much I love you? And now you're just serving me because it's the right thing to do? Oh, what a disappointment. And so Jesus is loving this church enough to warn them and to say, you better get this right. Well, I have a question for you. Do you love Jesus? Do you love Jesus with all of your heart, soul, mind, strength? Do you love him? How do you know? How do you know if you truly love him? Well, I think this. You'll know by recognizing your obedience to Jesus is done from a heart of appreciation for Jesus. That's why you serve him. That's why you obey him is because of what he's accomplished for you, all right? So the church must love Jesus above all else. Loving Jesus is more important than right living. You got to know that. Loving Jesus is the primary, is the church's primary focus as the church. That's where, that's our target that we're shooting at. And then lastly, number three, loving Jesus is the church's persistent pursuit. Now, I just asked you a question, okay? And the, and the question is, do you love Jesus? And then I said, how do you know? How do you know? And then I, I answered that by saying, you'll know by recognizing your obedience to Jesus is done from a heart of appreciation for Christ himself, right? For what he's done. But let me ask you this. If we're going to be honest, do you always obey Christ out of a heart of love? Do you always do that? Well, I think if we're going to be honest, the answer is no. So what do we do? Well, it's a lot like driving a car. Okay, and, and you might think, what? What are you talking about? Well, l let me explain. Think, think about it. Think about it this way. When you get into your car to drive to a certain destination, um, you're constantly turning the wheel, uh, adjusting and correcting your direction so you can get to your desired destination. You don't just simply hold the steering wheel in one locked position and hope you're going to make it to your destination, uh, you know, the place that you want to go. If that's how you drive, you're going to be hitting a tree or you're going to be ramming your car up into someone's yard and maybe even drive it into their home. It's not a good plan to not constantly adjust your steering wheel. And, and even, what if you find out that you're, you're going in the wrong direction altogether, right? Well, you've got to make a serious course correction when that happens so that you can get to your desired destination. Well, this is the way it is in the... In the Christian life, you've got to see this, okay? Our destination, the direction or the place that we want to end up is, is obeying Christ from a heart of love for him. And then when we notice that our heart is growing cold, well, we ought to pay attention to that and self-correct. We ought to turn the wheel. In other words, we ought to repent and change our direction because our mind has been changed. We need to get back on track. This is, this is how we, by God's grace, do this. And, and, and this, is, this is, in fact, uh, what Jesus is admonishing the church at Ephesus in, in the last few verses of our text. I want you to look at Christ's process here as we go through. We're going to see the procedure, the penalty, and then the promise. For, first, let's look at his procedure. Okay, His procedure is remember your first love. Revelation 2.5, he says, this is the first thing I want you to do. I want you to remember your first love. Get back to the starting point. Go back to where you've been. You know, sometimes when you're married and you think, oh, I'm, I'm really frustrated with my wife or my husband. And sometimes you go back and you think, oh, I remember when I first laid eyes on that guy or that lady. And, and you kind of rekindle that flame in your heart. That's a little bit about what's going on here. Remember your first love. All right? So that's the first thing. Uh, he says, remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. And then number two, repent of your lack of love. That's it's simply, he says, repent. What does repent mean? It means to change your mind so that it leads to a change of direction. When you notice that your heart is growing cold, repent of that. Course correction. And get back on track. And then number three, return to your first love. Look at the next part of, uh, of verse five. And do the works that you did at first, okay? Return. Get back at it. Start doing the things with the right motivation of heart that you did from the beginning. Do it with the right motivation. 
right? So that's the, that's the first thing we see, the procedure. Remember your first love, repent of your lack of love, and then return to your first love. But then let's, then he points out the penalty here. I want you to see this. Look at the next part of verse 5, the last part. He says, if not, if you don't go through that process, that procedure that I've laid out, if not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Okay, now the Lord is laying out a penalty to the church at Ephesus. Now, Remember back uh, in the last point, I said there were more consequences for a church if it abandoned her first love? Well, here it is. Here it is. If the church at Ephesus refused to listen to these words of Christ, they would run the risk. Hear this. They would run the risk of him removing their lampstand from its place. In other words, if they failed to repent, if they failed to respond to his warning, the light of their witness, their... their uh, their, their witness as a church would be extinguished. Wow. Those are sobering words that the church of Ephesus needed to pay attention to. And by the way, that's a warning for us as well. We had better be a church that persistently pursues the love of God and the love of others. I love what Dr. Craig Keener says here. I think these are really helpful words. He says, a church where love ceases uh, and, and can no longer function properly as a local expression of Christ's many-membered body, this, this is one of the offenses for which a lampstand can be moved from its place. He says, through which a church can ultimately cease to exist as a church. He goes on to say, some churches die from a lack of outreach, a lack of planning for the rising generation, or a lack of courtesy to visitors. Some churches, on the other hand, like the church of Ephesus, may risk simply killing themselves off by not loving properly. So, if the local church listens, if the local church listens to, if this church at Ephesus listens to uh, to the words of Jesus, if we listen to the words of Jesus, there's a beautiful promise. Look at this promise in verse 7. It says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now, this promise, if you notice, is to individual members of this local congregation in Ephesus because he says, he singular, he uses the singular he, who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the one. So he's talking very much in a singular language. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. So, so our corporate love for Jesus has a profound effect on the individual person's eternal destiny. And, 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 and of course we understand that to be true, right? We understand that to be the case. If the church is unloving and it drives people away... Uh, because of that, un, I mean, it makes sense, right? That if the church acts in an unloving way, it's going to drive people away. And, and so we don't, we don't want to be an unloving congregation. But if there is a genuine God and other, others-focused love, the local body becomes so attractional, it's like, it's like a moth to the flame, right? And, and, and there, there's eternal significance to this. It says that I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise. I mean, this is the tree of life that we see way back in Genesis. Paradise that we see way back in Genesis, right? This, is, this has been the goal. This is the bookends. We have Genesis. We see Eden and we see creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. Now we're in, in Revelation. We're seeing the promised uh, restoration of God's uh, of God's glory to the earth and to the new heaven and to the new earth. So, listen, my friends here at Allendale Baptist Church, we have to be ever vigilant on the direction we are heading as individuals, as well as a body, not just individuals, but as a body. Our destination is to be a body who loves God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, with all of our strength, and, and we must love, our, love others as much as we love ourselves. And when we get off track, we need to self-correct and ensure that we are continuing to drive to our destination, to our goal of love. 
the love of Jesus. All right? Loving Jesus is the church's persistent pursuit, right? It's, we have to be persistent. When we get off track, we have to ooh, be persistent to get back on track. I love what 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 14 says. Let all that you do be done in love. So, as a church, we must constantly ask this question. And, 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 and as individuals, as, as uh, individual church, church members, we must constantly ask ourselves this question. Are we, everything that we are doing, is it done in love? Is my primary motivation the love for Christ and secondarily the love for others? It's imperative that you and I are honest with ourselves about this. It's imperative that you check your motives. And when you find yourself not serving with the right motive, not functioning in Christ's body with the right motive, what do you need to do? You need to repent and get back on track, right? And you need to pursue your first love again. Don't get to the place where Jesus writes a letter to Allendale Baptist Church and says, Hey guys, I appreciate all the good stuff you're doing, but you've lost your first love. And so everything else doesn't matter to me as much. You've got to get yourself back on track. I think it's a good warning for us as a church. The church must love Jesus above all else. It's more important. Loving Jesus is more important than right living. And loving Jesus must be our primary focus as a church. And loving Jesus is our persistent pursuit as a church. When we start getting off track, we got to self-correct to get back on track. You know, I love, I love that opening scene or that's that, well, the opening illustration I shared with you of Fiddler on the Roof and, uh, and Tevye asking his wife of 25 years, do you love me? Do you love me? And hopefully we as a church don't have the same incredulous response as, as Golda. Uh, look, Lord, look at all I'm doing for you. Look at all I've done. Look, I'm standing strong in orthodoxy. Look, I, I am, I'm standing against evil. Look, look at all these things that I'm doing. I'm serving you. I'm doing good works in your name. And Jesus looks back at us and says, but do you love me? Do you love me? I hope our answer isn't, I, I hope our answer is, I, I suppose I do. No, the bride of Christ, the bride of Christ must have a wholehearted love, a, a, a wholehearted devotion to Jesus Christ. And here's the deal, folks. When we get this right, when we love Christ the way we're supposed to love Christ, He's going to do amazing things with this church. So can I challenge you? Check yourself today. Do you love me? I hope you do. Father, thank you. Thank you for this challenge from this text of Scripture. Oh God, help us to love Jesus more than anything else. If we truly love Jesus, we're going to get our doctrine right. If we truly love Jesus, we're going to stand against evil. If we truly love Jesus, we're going to do good works in His name with joyful hearts. Oh God, help us not to be hypocritical. Help us not to be the kind of church that does right things without a heart of love for you. God, forgive us if that's, if that's where we've been. And God, bring us, help us to correct, help us to turn the wheel back so that we are pursuing Christ with everything that we have. And it's in Christ's name we pray this. Amen. Listen, I hope you, I hope you review these, this passage, these verses, and just consider the motive of your heart. Do you love Jesus with everything that you have? And may we be a church that loves Jesus with all that we have. And speaking of that, I want, you to, uh, I want you to just go for the rest of this day and the rest of this week and be the church, the church of Jesus Christ that he's called you to be. And, and first and foremost, demonstrate the love that you have for Christ by loving others around you. All right? God bless you and have a wonderful day.